I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speaker and talk to you about SIDAC, which is SICRI's flagship development program that is being offered annually. But first, a little information uh, further about Shamshir Singh. Sorry, I skipped a few. Shibshir Singh is the spokesperson for the National Sikh Youth Federation, a UK-based think tank and educational charity. He has a master's degree in computer science from Kingston University, and his interests include reading, poetry, films, and architecture, and he is also coming to Siddhak this year. Now, Siddhak, I'd like to invite everyone this summer in San Antonio from July 8th through 28th through August 10 for an intensive immersion in Sikh culture, language, values, and community through heightened understanding of Bani, scriptures, Tariq, history, and Rahat, which is discipline. When you register for Siddhak, you select a focus for your classroom session from one of the three tracks, Sikhi 101, Sikhi 201, and Gurmukhi 101. You can spend half your day in specialized classroom sessions with others who have chosen the same track. Later on in the afternoon, the group comes together for Sikhi develop, leadership development workshops, presentations, and activities. Siddhak also features special nights set aside for talent shows, ultimate frisbee, a trip into downtown San Antonio, nature walks, and other activities to provide bonding and inspiration. Every year, we, we hear back from Siddhak alumni about how valuable the bonds they formed at Siddhak have been in terms of friendship, networking, and continued academic and spiritual development. Please visit www.sicri.org for more details. We are currently accepting applications for all tracks, but don't delay, especially if you're planning on traveling from outside of US or Canada, as all visa process can take a few months. You can also like us on Facebook, too, and also follow us on Twitter to get news like upcoming Siddhak announcements, videos, and stay informed of new resources in general, like this year's live webinar you're about to attend, which Sikri is putting out for learners everywhere. Now with that, I'd like to pass over to Shimshir Singh to begin today's presentation. Why could you go Khalsa? Why could you keep Fateh? Why could you go Khalsa? Why could you keep Fateh? We can hear you, Vizi. Okay. Um, and we can see your can screen. You see my screen? Is there yes, we can. Okay. So, um, why would you have why would you keep up there? Um, this presentation is entitled um, 1984 Memories and Activism. Um, before I begin, um, I'd just like to talk about uh, Siddhak quickly. Um, uh, Gurinder Singh mentioned that I'm coming this year to Siddhak. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity uh, to engage in a formal environment and formal learning about Sikh history and political events and Gurmukhi, whichever track you choose. Um, one thing that I haven't been able to do in my life so far is to engage in an environment where I'm learning um, formally about Sikhi in a structured way. Um, it's something that I'm very um, keen to experience. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see how how it will uh, work. So, um, if you if you have friends or family that are interested, I would seriously recommend um, that they um, check out the Sikri um, website and the information. There's some, there's a few videos on there uh, about Siddhak. Everyone that I know that's been has recommended it very very highly. Um, okay, so I'd like to begin the presentation. So this presentation is going to look at the, the topic of 1984. Um, this year is the 29 years um, since the invasion of the Vars Sahib in June 1984. So we'll begin by looking um, into the past and uh, we were looking at the conditions um, that created the environment for the most recent invasion of the Vars Sahib. And we'll try to understand the environment in which these conditions developed. Um, and then we'll be looking at uh, very briefly um, at the propaganda war uh, that ensued immediately after and uh, before but in intensified um, after the, the Varsite invasion. Um, and then we'll be looking at the term 1984, um, what it symbolizes and, and uh, 
and what um, resonance this term holds amongst the Sikh community um, and the meaning it's taken, especially amongst the younger generation. And then we'll be looking at the dichotomy between activism uh, and academia um, and a gulf that, in my opinion, has, has developed uh, between the two. And then I'll offer a few um, thoughts on the future um, of this conversation, this long conversation that we've been having uh, for the last 29 years about 1984. So um, for me and for a lot of my colleagues, we trace the beginnings of the events of 1984 to 1849. Um, this was when Punjab was annexed uh, by the British Empire. I won't provide too much details about what happened and there's a lot of information that, that is available out there um, on the annexation of the Punjab and, and the, the two wars um, and the numerous battles the Sikhs fought. But the outcomes are very, very interesting. Um, firstly, um, Sir Henry Lawrence was made um, a political, uh, who was a political agent for the really what the inner workings of the Darbar were, so then how we could uh, manipulate and apply pressure um, to, uh, to their advantage. And we also see the, the surrender of the Jalanda Duwab, that's the area that you can see where it says Jalanda between the river Satluj and the river Bias, that entire area was surrendered over to the East India Company. And it's a very strategic area um, and also a 50 million rupee indemnity, which is uh, you know, in, in essence, a tax was imposed on the Sikh Empire. Um, and this quote here, so, um, in lieu of this sum, um, all the forts, territories, rights and interests in the hill countries situated between the rivers Bias and Indus um, were given over, the control of these were given over to the East India Company. So that's effectively all of Punjab. And then, as we know, Maharaja Dilip Singh was made to sign away all claims to the rule of Punjab. And he was, he was then taken to Britain um, and he was exiled effectively. Um, also Maharani Jindko, his mother, um, was exiled. Um, and Hen Henry Lawrence and the rest of the British administration at that time controlled the policy of the Darbar. And you're thinking, like me, why is this uh, important and how is this uh, relevant? Well, this lays the groundwork for the Radcliffe Line, which we'll talk about later on. And the period that we see between 1849 and partition in 1947, this is almost 100 years, um, there was intense warfare and conflict, not only within India, but also globally we see the First and Second World War happening. So this, this whole situation, the repercussions of this are felt for a, a long time afterwards. So just, uh, so the, okay. So um, yeah, as I said, uh, um, 100 years of conflicts um, followed immediately after the annexation of the Punjab. Um, and it began immediately after the annexation uh, in 1849 with the Nirankari reforms. Um, the Nirankaris uh, were a group that sought to, um, in, their, in their original essence, sought to return the Sikh faith and the Sikh practices um, and bring them closely in alignment with the teachings of the Guru. Because during the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and, and afterwards, um, a lot of practices were introduced that were contrary to the teachings of the Gurus. So that's the first reform movement that we see. And then we see the Singh Sabha movement, which was established in 1873 and continued for a long time afterwards. Um, and then we see the Gadar Party, um, which was actually born from the diaspora um, in, in California. 
and they went and fought against British imperialism and, and it began this whole um, uh, this whole conflict um, began um, with the Gaza Party and, and before them that uh, Punjab um, had to be liberated from the control of the British. So from from very early on, immediately after the annexation of the Punjab, there was this um, urge amongst the Sikh intelligentsia, amongst the Sikh activism, activists that we have to reunite um, the Punjab, we have to reunite the Sikh people of Punjab and we have to uh, gain the independence of the Sikh empire uh, because at this time now the, the Sikhs are, are stateless, they, they don't have an empire, uh, they don't maintain control of their political affairs, the, the armies of the empire are disbanded, so um, there's a, an urge to uh, return back to the glory of the empire. And then we see um, Sakan and Kana Saib. And Sakan and Kana Saib is, is a very, very interesting um, event in our history. So what happens, uh, very briefly in Sakan and Kana, um, what happens is there's sacrilege at Nankana Saib, which is a very important historical Gurdwara. Um, and there's a, a gentleman in control uh, of it, it's called the Mahant. Um, and there's various negotiations with the Mahant, and the Sikhs try to set out. Um, so and arrange a meeting with him on uh, numerous occasions. Uh, he fails to turn up and and then um, a group of Sikhs organize, activists organize and they decide to form a Shahid Gijatha, a band of martyrs uh, that will go uh, in a group of around 150 to 200 Sikhs, um, go to Nankana Sahib and they're fired upon and they're killed. And then later on, um, quite immediately afterwards, a larger group of around two more than 2,000 Sikhs um, form a, in essentially a militia and uh, and join up and go to Nkana Saib. And the commissioner at that time um, who's residing in Lahore uh, is very nervous now um, that this large group of Sikhs gathered and are heading towards Nkana Saib and there's going to be a huge disturbance. So he decides to hand over the keys. Um, there's a lot of pressure involved and the, the Mahant is then uh, eventually sentenced to death. But what's interesting is the workings that, that are happening in the background. Um, at the end, when the Sikhs gather in a large force and march on Nkana Sahib uh, to liberate the shrine, uh, liberate the Gurdwara, sorry, um, the government at the time moves to hand over the keys. But this is the same government that earlier was arming the Mahants um, and providing them with aid so that they could fight against the Sikhs. And, essentially uh, create the environment in which the first band of Sikhs are, are all killed. Um, and they did not intervene, the government, at all. When the Sikhs protested, when the Sikhs tried to negotiate, there was no intervention of the government. And this is a, an, even at this time it was the British government, but it's a similar pattern that we see repeat itself through other events in our history. And then we see um, the Jallianwala Bagh incident, a, a very famous incident in um, in Sikh history, uh, where Sikhs are organizing again a rebellion against a British Raj uh, in India. And then we see the launch of the Akali movement, and this is a, a, f a formal political organization now set up to represent Sikh demands um, and to represent the Sikh community and their issues and to be a political voice and a political organization for the Sikh community. And very quickly, within a one year, um, this organization splits uh, and we see the development of the Babbar Akali movement. And the Babbar Akalis, they felt that the Akali movement and their, their strategies and their tactics um, were not going to achieve the aims that the Sikhs wanted. So they set up a program where they um, assassinated government ministers and informers. They recruited World War One veterans um, because at this time the Sikhs were also fighting. Um, we say the Sikhs fought for the British, but I would say the Sikhs fought against the ideas of fascism because they were opposing the same fascism at home that they were opposing in Europe and the rest of the world. So it's, uh, the idea that the Sikhs are fighting for the British or with the British is, is very interesting because at home they're fighting ag uh, against the British. But here we see that the, the Sikhs aren't ideologically against British people. They're against the ideas of domination, of political, religious domination, fascism. 
So it's very natural for the Sikhs to, to come to the aid of the British at one hand and, and fight them at home on the other. And we, we see uh, numerous accounts from this period of history where British officers say that even though the Sikhs are our enemies, they fight very valiantly and we will trust our women with them. We see uh, this is a recurring theme throughout our history. So with the Babur Akali movement, um, uh, militarized uh, the demands of the Akali movement, and then we see something called the Chabiana Morcha, which was to gain the keys uh, for Godware at that time. Um, and then we see uh, Jetoda Morcha. And Jetoda Morcha is also, I mean, all these events have a lot of history behind them. Um, but Jetoda Morcha is particularly interesting because this was a purely political Morcha. This was a purely political agitation. And it was essentially based around the, the, the deposition of the Maharaja of Naba. Um, and the Sikhs wanted to restore him to his throne because he was deposed by the British. Um, and essentially he was very favorable to the Sikhs um, and he was his ideas and goals were in alignment with the Sikh demands um, for their independence and, and a return to a sovereign uh, nation. Um, and the British at that time uh, issued a lot of propaganda saying that the Maharaja had voluntarily abdicated um, and the Sikhs marched against the, the British um, and the, and also um, the British at the time they changed an Akhand party so it's a, a, it's a, um, a religious interference um, and this is where we see um, the religious interference being developed as a means of control because the Sikhs connection with their faith runs very deeply it's ingrained in their, their existence um, as Sikhs. So Sikhs um, I don't want to get into um, theology here but we all know that Sikhi isn't defined as a religion to define it as a religion is to give it a very um, small definition and to limit its scope it, it, it's uh, it's much bigger than that it's, it's a way of life it's your entire identity and everything is linked um, to your faith and your ideas so um, so we here we see the British interfering and, and we see a purely political um, movement here and their uh, their interference is based on religious grounds and um, again to as a means of control. Um, and this was a peaceful agitation uh, as well, which is also very important. This agitation was entirely peaceful. This was not a militaristic um, agitation. There was no violence involved. The Sikhs from the outset decided that this was going to be a political and a peaceful agitation. And then we see the, the, Gurdwara, um, the Gurdwara's Act, which gave control of Gurdwara and, and brought some measure um, uh, of uh, reform uh, it put the control of Gurdwaras in the hands of the Sikhs. And then we see the Punjabi Suba movement where the Sikhs agitated for the right to speak Punjabi in Punjab um, and we see a huge number of Sikhs uh, voluntarily caught arrest and engage in peaceful demonstrations and agitations um, so that they could retain the language of Punjabi in the state of Punjab. And this was the only state um, after uh, partition that had to engage in such actions to have their linguistic rights recognized. So we've jumped, um, this is why it's 100 years of conflict, so we jumped just slightly after partition here to 1950. So um, after we've seen the annexation um, and after the annexation the environment that it created um, it led to a long period where Sikhs tried to reorganize themselves um, and try to define their direction um, and to fight against a lot of religious interference that was taking place as the controls of their Gurdwari, um, the controls of who would read Bart and how it would be, uh, how prayers would be performed. So there's, um, at this time it's a, it's a, a hugely transitional phase uh, for the Sikh community. Um, the Sikhs fight very valiantly in World War I and World War II. Um, and the Sikhs fight extremely um, hard against the British and form the vanguard of the Indian independence movement uh, in ousting the British uh, Raj out, uh, out of India. Um, and the Sikhs had hopes of an autonomous region. Um, if you see the light green area, that's uh, the outline of the Punjab. Um, so see, uh, Lahore is where the Darbar, the court of the uh, Sikh Maharaja Maharaj and Jeet Singh was Amritsar is where their bar side the Golden Temple is. So Sikhs had huge hopes that Punjab would be returned to their control so that they could manage their affairs how they saw fit 
and that was the understanding in which they joined their forces with the Indian state, uh, with the uh, the Indian government, and, uh, the, uh, the pre-independence Indian government and the Indian political forces. They fought for uh, an independent Punjab. And this is a very famous quotation from Nehru. The brave Sikhs of Punjab are entitled to special consideration. I see nothing wrong in an area and a setup in the north wherein the Sikhs can also experience the glow of freedom. And um, this was said at a time when the area that would be divided, the partition that would take place, the, the new countries that would be formed, uh, all of these negotiations were taking place and it was very, very clear to Sikhs. This wasn't something um, that Sikhs uh, had a, a doubt about. This was very, very clear um, to them that this would take place. Um, and we can see it from the drawings uh, of, the, of the cartographers from the British Empire. We can see um, the area, you can see Lahore, where Sikhs are. They're very, all of the maps that are drawn um, during this time, it's very clearly made out that this is an area of Sikh occupation. If you, can, if you notice the, the green, the, the browns uh, over where it says Lahore and near the top of the map. Um, and here we have a, another map. And, and if you can see, uh, like the previous map, when light green, it's virtually the same area. In fact, this extends somewhat, and it goes, it encompasses an area around Delhi. Um, and this area, this map is showing areas of British control. Um, and the British know that they've taken this area um, from from the Sikhs. Um, and here is a, an example of, of one Dwab. A Dwab is an area between the two uh, between two rivers. So this is between the rivers Satluj and Ravi. Um, and this is showing the distribution of communities and which percentage of people living in various districts, um, what their religious domination is. Uh, again, I use the word religion, but for the sake of understanding, it's easier. And you can see here Amritsar um, and Tarn Tarn uh, are particularly interesting because those are uh, majority areas of Sikhs. And then we have Lahore and Kasol, where it's very close. Uh, the white, this, the white square is, represents Sikhs. Um, and then in other areas, we have, uh, except for uh, right at the top there, Patan Court and Sakha, uh, Sakha Gar, um we have a lot of Sikh population, and these maps are being drawn, and and it's known. Uh, what I'm trying to um, represent here is is that it's known that the Sikh community exists and it lives in these areas. It's very clear. It's, it's not something that Sikhs should have to justify their existence or their claim to this territory. But then we see things like this uh, taking place. This is uh, these are the maps that were uh, drawn and the research that was done um, before partition. Um, the research was undertaken by Radcliffe um, to understand where the population lies. And now we see Congress Sikh. If we look at the previous slide. Um, it's Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, uh, Hindus, etc. And now we're being, uh, including Sejo Khas, now we're being lumped together uh, as as uh, the Congress and, uh, and the Sikhs, and then we have the Muslims. And this, and, and the areas of Sikh population are, are very small now on this map. And then we see this happen. We see India, the, the map, the political map of India being drawn, uh, Punjab reduced to a, a less than a third of its original size. We see huge uh, border conflicts, uh, half a million people lose their lives traveling uh, between the new Pakistan and India. And, and Sikhs are, are left totally out of the equation. In fact, um, as I mentioned earlier, they have to undertake agitations and, and uh, for Morcha, uh, for their language, for the language of Punjabi. Um, we see Lahore is, is given over into Pakistan and Chandigarh, the, which is no doubt part of Punjab, is now a uh, union territory and part of India, not part of Punjab. And Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, two areas of large Sikh population are taken away from Punjab. So then we see an environment in which Sikh intellectuals get together. This is a picture of Kapoor Singh uh, with Janas Singh Pindrawale. Um, and they come together um, and they form the non prosaib resolution in 1973. Uh, and the non resolution is an entirely political document and essentially it has these demands that are laid out here. 
that there should be autonomy within the state of Punjab, and there should be the linguistic rights of the Punjabi speaking people, they should be preserved, and there should be a right to a state capital, Chandigarh, um, river water rights, workers' rights, farmers' rights, economic rights, and rights to the development of industry. If we jump forward to 2013, these are the same issues that are plaguing Punjab today. Uh, we see some of the highest rates of farmer suicide in the world. Uh, we see a huge disparity between the genders, a, huge, a high number of female infanticide. We see a huge number of drug use. Um, and we see very low opportunities for work um, and very low investment from the central government in, towards infrastructure in Punjab and a diversion of the Punjabi river waters that is resulting in desertification of Punjab and affecting uh, the farmers further. And we also see uh, something that's much more acute and a lot more, um, or not a lot more interesting, but very, very interesting is the linguistic domination of the Hindi language over the Punjabi language. The state language, um, the national language is Hindi in India, and in Punjab, Hindi is the preferred language that is taught. And the Punjabi people um, I had a very interesting conversation with a relative that Punjab, Punjabi is viewed almost as a backwards language. And, uh, even if you watch uh, any of these uh, so-called Punjabi channels, that, like Z Punjabi, a lot of the presentation that is done, especially when it comes to the news or current affairs show, um, a lot of this stuff is done in Hindi. So we see a marginalization of the, the Punjabi language. So going back to 1973, at, at the time the Sikh uh, intellectuals understood that these issues are huge issues and that they're going to change the, the fate of the people of Punjab, that if they don't have autonomy, um, and one, oh, one thing that's very clear here, the word autonomy is used, uh, not independence, the Sikhs don't want a separate country, um, they, before they, um, the Sikhs agitated to uh, live within this new version of India that is going to be created after partition, where they would enjoy autonomy, where they would uh, manage their own affairs because the Sikhs are a sovereign people. There is no question about that because as we've seen, the British uh, knew who the Sikhs were, they fought two wars to acquire their territory, they signed various treaties where the territory of the Sikhs was ceded to the British, so there's no question that the Sikhs are a sovereign people. Um, so this question doesn't arise here, we're talking about autonomies that Sikhs can manage their own affairs, not set up a, a separate country. And this document was um, hugely demonized as a successionist document, as a document of uh, separating India, and this paranoid fear um, of the destabilization of the Indian uh, nation um, was uh, propagated uh, by the central government. Then after um, the resolution was drawn, we see the state of emergency imposed by Indira Gandhi, where she suspends the right to life. And the Sikhs, again, um, uh, fight in the vanguard, um, and the Sikh political party, the Akali Dal, um, is the only political party that formally um, agitates uh, against um, the national emergency, uh, where Indira Gandhi, as I mentioned, suspends the right to life. Um, she imposes martial law, um, and as you can see, the headline from the, uh, the Hindu um, press censorship is imposed. And then we see numerous um, agitations with the Sikhs, um, and one very prominent one is the massacre um, of 13 Sikhs um, who went to protest against uh, a very controversial cult leader uh, in 1978. Um, and this is where we see the Indian state's flirtation and uh, their fascination um, with uh, funding and propagating Sikh uh, cults and sects. So it seems that any individual that is willing to preach a counter Sikh doctrine where a lot of the things that they're teaching, 70% or 80% of it will be in line with Sikh teachings because Sikh teachings are very universal. Uh, but then there'll be that 20%, the 10% which will be in entirely based around giving that individual, the leader of this cult or the sect, prominence um, and establishing themselves as, as a godlike man. And, and there's numerous articles on, the, uh, on this subject, um, subjects of deras as, they, as they're called, um, where these godlike people reside in uh, fortified compounds essentially and enjoy a huge amount 
um, of state protection. And this is where we um, see uh, this was a Nakali Nirankari movement. Um, and as we seen earlier, the Nirankaris were a part of a uh, of a movement that uh, the Nirankari movement in its uh, truest form, where they f tried to return Sikhs to the, the um, uh, align the Sikh uh, behavior at the time with the practices of the Guru. Um, and today we've seen, uh, in 1978, we see the Nankari split up and r radical individuals uh, receive state funding, receive state protection uh, to insult Sikhs. And this was a, a peaceful um, demonstration that the Sikhs went on. Um, this gentleman uh, insulted uh, the Sikhs uh, guru, um, which is um, it is bound to inflare um, a lot of passion uh, amongst the Sikhs. Um, and the Sikhs that went to protest were shot at, not only by the members of the sect, but also the police. There were a lot of eyewitness accounts at the time that identified police officers uh, who fired upon the Sikhs and they, they threw acid at them and bricks and, and all sorts of So it was a very messy uh, and brutal affair. Um, and this uh, really um, sparked a change uh, amongst the Sikh psyche. And then we see the the Morcha, the the Tarbiyud Morcha, as it was called, or uh, as we call it, the the Sikh Civil Rights Movement was launched formally in 1982 from Akal Takat Sahib, the seat of Sikh spiritual and political sovereignty, uh, a, a historic place. Um, I, I I don't know if I need to go into the history of the Akal Takat. It was uh, created uh, not as a gurdwara, not as a place of worship, but as a political seat by the sixth Guru. Um, the representation of Sikhs' sovereignty and a unique ideology in this world. Um, so what better place to launch the Tarmiyud Morcha, the Sikh civil rights movement, than from the Akal Takat. And, and it was launched by Sanjanel Singh Ji Pindrawale. Um, and here we see um, uh, first of a few quotations that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. And this was uh, the Week a news magazine um, in 1982 and it says that 220 killings um, in the first 19 months of the Tarmiyud Morcha. Out of these 220 persons killed between August and February, 82 and 84, 190 were Sikhs and 30 were Hindus. And the reason I, I present this quote is because at that time, um, the government engaged in a lot of propaganda that the Tarmiyud Morcha, um, the Anandpur Sahib resolution, um, both of these were designed to split India and to, um, they, were, uh, they were successionists that they wanted to create a separate um, nation for Sikhs and it was essentially a Hindu-Sikh conflict and Sikhs are in engaging in communal violence and they're trying to kill Hindus and in, in many newspapers were reporting that Sikhs were killing Hindus. Um, but this wasn't the case at all. Uh, the Anandpur Sahib resolution was uh, very formally uh, launched after uh, a long time of research, over six years, um, and it went through various drafts, and the Sikhs wanted to engage in negotiations with the government, but they weren't interested, so they had to launch the Tarmiyud Morcha, which was a series of um, peaceful political agitations, non-cooperation, to realize the demands that were set out in the Anandpur Sahib resolution, which you can read uh, more about these um, online. but. Now this is all very important to understanding uh, the environment in which the invasion um, of the Rasab took place. So, um, Sant Jana Singh Ji on the 27th of March 1983, um, when asked about Khalistan says, I don't oppose it nor do I support it. As yet we do not ask for it. Indira Gandhi should tell us whether she wants to keep us in Hindustan or not. We like to live together with the rest of uh, Indians. We like to live in India. Indira should tell us whether she wants to keep us or not. Um, Sant Janel Singh Ji has always built as this uh, extremely radical, somewhat fanatical Sikh leader who's only interested in this separate Sikh nation of Khalistan. Um, he's interested in killing Hindus. There's a lot of uh, myths um, and lies that are, are, are spread. Uh, which was part of a, a very deliberate and um, a very controlled government propaganda campaign to malign his, uh, essentially to um, malign his character and to character assassinate him. Um, but as you can see here, um, it's very clear that this is just before 1984, 
um, a year more than just a year before the invasion, the Sanskrit says that this isn't about um, an, a separate country. In fact, if you read the Anand Prasad resolution, you'd, you'd find it's not about a separate nation. It is about uh, the economy of Sikhs. And here we see um, the Tribune, a major newspaper in India, which is the security forces, especially paramilitary forces, resorted to unprovoked and indiscriminate firing. Um, what's important here is we're, we're now starting to see the use of paramilitary forces. Now these are above um, the police, but we're not quite military. These forces are being gathered together to engage uh, in a long-term conflict with the Sikhs. And the Indian paper, uh, which is called The Sunday, says, Today Mrs. Gandhi, as a result of the cynical game for political power uh, and by her personal example of hobnobbing with Hindu religious elements, has de-secularized the Congress. Thus, when Hindu mobs were lynching Sikhs and destroying Gurdwaras in Panipat, no congressman came forward to restrain the crowds. In fact, some Congress leaders, including some ministers, were enjoying the spectacle. And this is just before the, the Barsaib invasion, which takes place a few months after this. Um, this is just before, and we're seeing this continuation from, from before 1978 to 1984, we're seeing the Sikhs engaging in uh, demonstrations and peaceful agitations, and we're seeing the reaction of the state um, is undiscriminate and uh, unprovoked and un indiscriminate firing. And this is not just happening in one centralized area of, um, of Amritsar. This is happening all over uh, Punjab and all over India, in fact. Um, and this is an extremely important quotation. It says, the police are terrorizing the people. All those who are supposed to protect us, like the border security force, Punjab police, central reserve police force, military and central government forces are the real terrorists and extremists, because terrorists are those who have crossed all limits of law and humanity. Now the government and its agencies have crossed all those limits. And this is the finance minister, Pranab Mukherjee, in a press statement in Calcutta on the 1st of July, 1984. So this is just after um, the invasion of Darbar Sahib, um, and this isn't a, a Sikh, this is a, a government minister um, who's speaking out against the violence that is being inflicted on the Sikh community. So what was so bad that the Sikhs were going to do that resulted in the invasion of the Darbar Sahib, which we're going to talk about just now? Well. As part of the agitation for the realization of the Anandpur Sahib Resolution of 1973, um, via the Tarmiyud Morcha, the Sikhs decided that uh, the negotiations and the peaceful agitations and the political non-cooperation that the Sikhs were engaging in and the community um, that we were engaging in as a whole were being met with a huge amount of brutality and violence from the state. So they decided to escalate um, escalate the way in which they would deal with this situation within the framework of their original goals, their original vision of how they would realize the Anand Prasad resolution. And the next step, which was a huge step, was to withhold the grain shipments that, were, that originated in Punjab and that were distributed throughout India. And Punjab, as we know, uh, today it's far from it, but it is the breadbasket of India, um, and it's still an important agricultural center. And in fact, uh, control of agricultural production in Punjab has been a very tense issue, because if the means of production are in the hands of the people, then they have more control over their future and more control over uh, their standard of living and, and more control over their political uh, uh, aspirations. So the Sikhs decided that we, they were going to withhold the grain shipments. And this was to take place on the 3rd of June. This was planned. Um, the message has been, had been sent out into the community. Um, because uh, what we've got to understand is the Tarmiyud Morcha, the Anand Prasad resolution, 
the previous morcha that we talked about very briefly, the Jetsoda morcha, the Babrakalis, and the um, Nkana said these weren't fringe um, uh, agitations, these weren't fringe movements, these were popularist movements that involved the people of Punjab, the majority of whom are Sikh, but we have Hindu uh, people, Muslim people, Christians that lived in Punjab because these issues affected all of the people of Punjab, not just um, the Sikhs. So this is the, the next step that the Sikhs are, are going to take. General Baraf says, we cannot allow a few scoundrels to hold the government of India at ransom. We shall see to it that they are on their knees in just two hours. And this is General Bra on the 2nd of June. So there is a very interesting quote that's um, from General Bra that says, um, actually I don't know whether it's from General Bra or um, one of his colleagues in the military that says that they went into the Darbar Sahib with humility and prayers on in, on their hearts, uh, on their lips, or, or something of the sort. But here we see a very uh, different picture. Um, they're viewing uh, the Sikhs that are there in in the Bar Sahib, that are there in Amritsar as, as scoundrels. Um, this is from from the the Guardian newspaper. All through the tangle in Punjab. The government has preferred to talk religion instead of economics and politics in its dealings with the Akali party, which represents the interests of Punjabi peasants and farmers, the majority of whom are Sikhs. The farmers say, give us more of our own river waters to irrigate our fields or refer the matter to the Supreme Court. The government replies, we allow you to broadcast religious music over all India radio. As for the water, we shall appoint a tribunal to give a ruling on the dispute. The Akali say that Punjab and other states throughout India should be given greater economic powers and allowed to manage their own affairs. New Delhi retorts, this is talk of succession, it must be inspired by a foreign power. So. And this is the 8th of June, 1984. So the idea that Sikhs were gathering in a political movement for political, economic, social, and religious demands isn't an alien notion, isn't something that the Sikhs have invented or fabricated uh, 29 years later. This is something that not only the Indian government but also the international media at the time acknowledged. It's very important that they're acknowledging this as it's happening. There isn't this, this uh, picture that's uh, certainly presented today that the Sikhs were militants, um, that essentially that they wanted a separate country, so they fortified um, the Bar Sahib and they were engaging in this militaristic movement against the government. And as, as General Bra says, we cannot allow a few scoundrels um, to hold the government of India at ransom. Um, so how how were these Sikhs planning to hold the, the government of India to ransom? Um, did they have a, a nuclear weapon? Did they have anti-aircraft weaponry? Did they have anti-tank weaponry? We'll talk about that shortly. So what happens is this the invasion that takes place in June 1984, a pre-planned invasion that had been in the pipework for a long time before June 1984, as acknowledged by Lieutenant General um, A.K. Sinha, um, who was pitted, uh, who's, who was marked to lead um, this invasion, but refused because he didn't believe that this level of military intervention um, of the state against its own population was needed. Um, he he famously said that uh, I, I'll negotiate with Bin Rawale myself um, if you send uh, me to do it. And he refused to lead um, the invasion, and he was replaced, and and it went ahead as as planned. So we see the government use a huge number of troops and and heavy weapons. So here, here are some key facts of the invasion. 
So officially, the government went to arrest 200 separatist terrorists. Now, that was their official line. So the few scoundrels that um, Bra was talking about earlier, um, they've given them a number. So essentially, 200. And this was um, the broader number for uh, the number of armed Sikhs that were inside the Barsab at the time. Uh, officially, though, I think there's a schedule where they talk about 30 to 40 specific people uh, specific people that they want to arrest, uh, which they later acknowledged weren't in the Darbar Sahib. Um, but that's a, a, another thing. Um, so 70 to 150,000 troops were deployed into Amritsar to arrest uh, 200 um, Sikhs. Um, now, as I said earlier, um, what, what type of weaponry uh, did these Sikhs have? Well, by all accounts, um, apart from the, the government accounts, um, but by all independent sources, the Sikhs mainly had single-shot rifles um, and shotguns. So they didn't have a, a vastly sophisticated weaponry to be holding the government to ransom, as Bra has said. The government also instilled a Punjab-wide curfew, a media blackout, a roadblock, no transportation of goods or people, um, no human rights monitors allowed in, no news report uh, whatsoever. Um, and that's very strange, especially when you put that right next to the fact that the state now has 70 to 150,000 troops that are deployed in Punjab, and uh, the majority of them are concentrated around Amritsar, but all of Punjab is essentially under martial law. So it's, um, if, it's a, if it's a question of security, there seems to be more than enough um, police uh, and military personnel, not even police, military personnel to deal with any security issues. The army opens fire on the 1st of June, uh, killing eight people. Um, and this was an unprovoked firing. Um, this was uh, totally indiscriminate. Um, they killed eight people uh, on the 1st of June. This was before the official operation, um, as the government has called it, uh, had begun. Um, the main invasion coincides with the Shahid Bipurab of Guru Arjan Sahib. So this is a day um, where Sikhs are marking the martyrdom of the fifth Guru. Uh, it's huge numbers of, of pilgrims at the, the Bar Sahib. Um, it's a very historic day for Sikhs and it holds a lot of um, uh, value and it holds a lot of meaning for Sikhs. Um, and the invasion was scheduled to go ahead at this time. The army uses heavy artillery, poisonous gases, tanks, um, and helicopter gunships. Uh, amongst the artillery that the state uses are flathead shells, which are designed to penetrate through buildings and then explode, causing a huge amount of collateral damage. And the, the most shocking fact of all is there is no criminal case against General Singh Pindrani. This operation was, uh, as the government calls it, was illegal. Um, even under uh, Indian law, um, there was no justification for his arrest. Um, in fact, the Akal Takat has declared uh, Saint Janel Singh be a hero and a martyr. Um, there was absolutely no legal justification for um, arresting Saint Janel Singh before earlier, uh, which is very interesting. There was actually a warrant issued for his arrest, and uh, Saint Janel Singh famously presented himself at the police station and after inquiry and uh, his lawyers were there and uh, the police had to let him go because they had they had no grounds for arresting him. He, he wasn't a criminal, he hadn't committed any illegal activities. Um, so it's very clear, I mean he, he used to, uh, St. John L. Singh uh, very famously again used to conduct his sermons in public um, on rooftops uh, and there's um, reporters that are there at that time saying that they can see uh, Indian security forces and snipers on rooftops and, and they're, they're standing next to um, and sitting next to uh, General Singh Ji um, and if the Indian government wanted they could have assassinated him at any time but as we know that wasn't the real objective, the real objective was to crush the rising Sikh civil rights movement and the agitations that had been building for 50 years essentially. And, and then the Sikh reference library was burnt after the main operation. Um, and this is very important as well. The Sikh reference library was a non-military target. There was uh, no reports of anybody 
uh, with weapons or otherwise uh, in the seek reference library um, yet it was deliberately set on fire and as we know as we've seen earlier um, this pattern that I was talking about that the Sikhs have political demands and the state whether it was the British or whether it was in fact if we go be before the British whether it was the Mughal government at the time to counter Sikh political demands they begin religious interference and religious persecution as a means of control because they know that where the Sikhs get their strength of character from and their determination is is from um, the, the, the Sikh way, the teachings of the Guru. Um, and also more than 30 other Gurdwaras were attacked throughout Punjab simultaneously um, at the same time uh, as the invasion of the Sahib. So then immediately after um, uh, the Sahib, we see par paramilitary activities intensify uh, throughout Punjab and I uh, think I've got these uh, slides the wrong around, but um, in November we see uh, the genocide take place um, after the assassination of Indira Gandhi, um, the organized pogroms and the targeting of Sikh businesses and, and Sikh men um, and, and families um, in Delhi and the surrounding areas uh, where thousands of Sikhs uh, were killed by mobs. And, and this picture I want to bring your attention to with the, with the Sikh gentleman who's on fire on the ground. If you look very closely, um, the guys that are walking in the background, there's one gentleman in um, blue jeans and a green top and he's carrying what looks like a Kalashnikov. I mean you can see um, his hand on uh, in the, the barrel grip underneath and you can see the, the curvature of the magazine. And that's an automatic weapon. Um, automatic weapons weren't available to police at that time um, and they certainly were not available to civilians. So who is this guy and his friends next to him and where have they got these weapons from because the government has always maintained that this was a popular outpouring of grief, that this was a random acts of violence. Uh, there was no organization to it after the assassination of Indira Gandhi. Um, the, the the capital essentially exploded uh, and Sikhs were targeted because the Sikh gentlemen were, were bodyguards of Indira Gandhi that had conducted the assassination. But as we look at the events afterwards we realize that, that this was far from random acts of violence. There was a, the total involvement of the state. Um, there were reports published at the time that identified um, uh, individuals from the central government that not only encouraged the mobs but also uh, took uh, part in the violence. If we see this picture on the bottom left with the burning building, uh, which is a bookstore, uh, you see these gentlemen wearing um, these white uh, kurte. They're very similar to what um, Indian ministers uh, wear even today. I'm not saying that they are ministers, I'm just saying, you know, is. It's, it is what it is um, and we see a huge amount of violence take place in, in November and then immediately after the invasion of the Barsai we see um, the mop up as the government called it um, which is Operation Woodrose um, from 1984 to 1982 uh, and I apologize um, if this image offends you but this this is the reality of Punjab for a very, very long time. Uh, we saw entire families and villages targeted and a huge amount of brutality, uh, human rights violations, uh, torture, uh, rape used as a weapon of war um, and it was specifically, uh, specifically targeted towards Sikh males aged between 15 and 30. Um, the government was, um, forces um, the the military, um, paramilitary units were issued with directives that said that um, Sikhs are um, uh, separatists and that they're terrorists and uh, any Sikh that is baptized is an Amritari Sikh um, is uh, committed to a loot and arson and all these references are available uh, on, on the NSYF website. So we, we see a huge amount of violence and um, Punjab was in, in a state of emergency rule um, where the government um, gave 
the police and paramilitary forces, extraordinary powers. We saw TADA, which um, uh, the UN condemned as uh, a barbaric and draconian laws, w which assumed you were guilty until proven innocent, removed the right to a, a trial, and uh, trials could be conducted in secret. So um, we see you at this uh, uh, environment um, after the invasion of the Brasov. Um, and then we look at the propaganda one. I'm not going to um, talk too much about this. Um, I would highly recommend um, that you watch a video that was uh, made um, uh, by Sikri. Um, it's entitled 1984 Myth versus Reality. Uh, I highly recommend that you, if you have any questions about whether the Sikhs were terrorists or who Sanjay Singh was or, uh, or any of that, that video answers all of those questions. But I, I've included this here for the sake of completeness um, to say that there was a, a huge propaganda war that took place um, uh, from the Indian state. Um, there was an agencies set up that went above and beyond um, intelligence agencies that the Indian government traditionally used, such as uh, RAW and IB. Um, it was called the third agency. Um, and this was set up essentially to discredit Sikhs and to bring about the aspirations um, of the rulers um, of India. Um, and until this day, um, the title is A Nation Divided, until this day, um, the lies that were spread uh, via state control media perpetuate. Uh, to this day, we have um, a division in opinion. Uh, I think it's more prevalent um, amongst the older generation uh, a lot of the younger generation, um, a lot of the younger generation, are um, sorry. I'm just uh, a lot of the younger generation um, are more interested and uh, in conducting their own research because we've uh, grown up in an environment where a lot of us have undergone a formal education and we've grown up. Uh, it's, it, especially amongst the diaspora, uh, we've grown up in an environment where we've learned to not be afraid um, of questioning official statements and we're and we very interested in conducting our own independent research. So a lot of these myths, um, the, uh, the younger generation has, has, has had questions and has found answers, but the elder generation is still a victim to a, a larger degree of um, state propaganda. Um, and what's more interesting is, um, the vocabulary um, that is used by the, especially the international media um, and the, the Indian state is always going to refer uh, to uh, Sikhs that fought in the Darbar Sahib invasion and Sikhs that agitated for the political demands of the Sikh nation as terrorists and as separatists. That vocabulary is, is not going to change. Uh, I don't know what it will take to change it, but I don't see it changing anytime soon. Um, but the international media has uh, told this line um, uh, quite willingly, especially, um, I mean, I've seen articles in The Guardian uh, that, that talk about Sikh militants and Sikh separatists, and this is the same newspaper that uh, during the time acknowledged that this was a, a political situation, a uh, legitimate political situation. And if anything, the state was the one that was turning this political in situation into a religious situation, into, into a communal situation. And then we have uh, uh, Wikipedia wars. I don't know how many of you are, um, uh, have you probably all read Wikipedia articles and you probably all, uh, I don't know, feel offended when you read some of these Wikipedia articles, but I don't know how many of you uh, edit Wikipedia articles. Uh, I edit a few and um, there's something very interesting going on because when you edit Wikipedia articles related to uh, Sikh um, issues, um, there is a lot of conflict that takes place. Um, there's a lot of very opinionated and it seems very active individuals um, that I would say have a vested interest in maintaining um, a certain narrative on Wikipedia articles, especially uh, when talking about Sikh uh, his, uh, historic and political uh, topics. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to a parallel that exists amongst the Jewish community. Um, the Jewish community is quite open about this, and uh, if you'd like, you can do um, your research on this. Um, um, there is essentially a group referred to as the Wikipedia Jews, and they have uh, conventions where they teach um, anybody interested 
uh, in how to edit Wikipedia articles and they give them a narrative and they make sure that they have they always have um, a few uh, I think there's around a hundred or more than a hundred of these individuals and they always try to increase their numbers that they have dedicated Wikipedia art uh, editors who work on a voluntary basis who make sure that Wikipedia articles relating to Zionism or the Jewish state or Jewish political issues always reflect a certain narrative um, there's nothing like that in the Sikh community, but it seems on the other side of the scope, um, there is. Uh, I don't know who these individuals are or whether they work for an intelligence agency. I mean, we can only um, uh, we can only um, uh, we can we we can only uh, just guess really who, who these people are. But um, I'm sure you will have a few ideas. Um, and then we see the propaganda tapes, and you can watch the. There's a very interesting video on YouTube. It's actually called 1984, <clears throat> the anti-Sikh propaganda tapes. Um, and I know propaganda is spelt wrong, but that's how they spelt it in the the title of the video. Uh, perhaps that's a reflection um, of uh, other issues. Um, but this gov uh, this uh, tape was sent out to major international news outlets immediately following the Dirbar Sahib invasion and it was a very uh, carefully shot and edited uh, series of footage um, and as yet I'm not aware of any uh, Sikh rebuttal uh, to any of that footage but it uh, certainly makes for very interesting viewing and of course the time of um, the divided opinions on Sanchi and because uh, Sanchi was the face of the Parmyud Mocha he was the most prominent Sikh leader at that time um, he became a target for a huge amount um, of propaganda aimed at his character, aimed at his motives, aimed at his lifestyle, um, and uh, in fact even aimed at uh, his martyrdom, uh, whether or not he, 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 he was martyred or he's alive. or There's huge amounts of controversy. Um, again, I think they're more prevalent amongst the elder generation than, than the younger generation, but, but nonetheless they're there. So we we've looked at how um, we've looked at how uh, 1984, the environment within which this situation developed, the history um, from 1849, uh, from the annexation of the Punjab um, to uh, to a century of conflict and agitations by the Sikhs to re uh, retain or, or go uh, regain a sense of sovereignty. Uh, to regain control of their religious institutions, um, and again, I know I said um, you know uh, Sikhi is more of a way of life than uh, a religion, but it's such a common term to and an easy term to use. Um, we we see so from the annexation, we see a hundred years of conflict, and we see a huge number of political agitations by by the Sikhs for. Of grain, and then this then created the perfect environment for the invasion of the Bar Sahib, and and the invasion was essentially done to control the Sikh community, to stifle their dissent, um, to uh, get rid of their political aspirations, uh, and to subjugate an entire generation, as we've seen with Operation Woodrose. Uh, and Operation Woodrose, till this day, has has never been acknowledged by the Indian government. Um, the effects of it and the repercussions of it are still being felt within the Sikh community today because this wasn't a, a very, very long time ago. Uh, we're talking as recently as 1992 and those human rights violations that took place um, and uh, the, the shattering of families and the violence that was inflicted upon them uh, has a very real effect on the Sikh psyche and the Sikh culture and um, modes of expression to this day. So, this is it brings me on to the next section um, a loaded word so 1984 we see this uh, this term come 
to hold a huge amount of significance amongst the Sikh community. And um, just a, a small sample that I did for this presentation where I asked a few uh, individuals um, the meaning that 1984 held for them and, and there were a key themes um, that kept recurring again and again and again. This idea that Sikhs want justice, this idea of independence, of oppression, of freedom, of Khalistan, of never forgetting and of sovereignty and, and of lies. Um, this is a, a very important um, point that was mentioned uh, a number of times. And, and from my own observations uh, throughout my life, through the numerous uh, Sikh events that I've been to, the rallies and petitions, uh, these are are common terms that come to mind when we think of 1984. So 1984 is not just uh, a year now. This is a term for the oppression. Uh, it's a term for these ideas that are expressed in this image. Um, it's a term for the Sikh resistance. It's a term. Um, in fact, it's almost a malign term to, for this idea of Sikhs wanting justice because this is a, a very strange and very uh, um, modern concept because uh, Sikhs have always wanted justice but how it's translated uh, today is very 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 different from how it uh, manifested itself uh, in our history so 1984 is an extremely loaded term that has a lot of connotations and, uh, and it creates a lot of controversy um, I've just noticed a question okay um, So uh, if you just bear with me a second before I go into the next section. Um, Gurtej Singh asks, uh, Satish Jacob and Mark Tully in their book, uh, Amrit Sir Mrs. Gandhi's uh, Last Battle on page 112, mentioned that leading up to Operation Blue Star, Indra Gandhi had maintained a contact with Janelle Singh Pindrawale through the president of the Punjab Congress Party uh, Rag, Raghun, Raghundan Lal Bhatia, Tully and Jacob state that this contact was further maintained through Amrik Singh, a confidant of Janelle Singh Pindrawale. Tully and Jacob add that Bhatia would always send his car to Darbar Sahib to fetch Amrik Singh when required. Would you like to comment? Um, Tully is an extremely uh, and Tali and Jacob are, is an extremely questionable source. Um, I have a section in here uh, where I talk about uh, books um, and, and in, the, in fact this next section coming up. Um, so uh, I, uh, hopefully I'll, I will answer your question uh, um, in this next section. So activism and academia. Understanding how we've engaged uh, with 1984. Um, this is uh, my favorite section uh, of the presentation um, and trying to understand the response, um, what the diaspora has done, what, how have we tried to understand what 1984 is and how have we tried to express that understanding. So, so firstly, um, we've written, we've written a lot of books, um, not just the Sikh community but the non-Sikh community. Um, the very important people. Um, there's a book in here, um, The Gallant Defender by A.R. Dashi, which is a uh, um, military uh, personnel. Um, th there's been a huge number of books. Um, all of these sources, if um, I can share with, um, I, I, these are all on the nswife.org.uk website. Um, all, all of these books, and in fact, there's a, there's a longer list. Um, but these ones specifically relate to uh, 1984. You've got uh, India Commits Suicide When a Tree Shook Dili. Bullet for Bullet, written by Ribera, who was a police officer who um, engaged uh, in activities where he recruited um, black cats, which were criminals, which then uh, dressed as Sikh um, activists um, and would uh, uh, commit violations in Sikh households and shout pro-Sikh slogans and, and further this division. Um, We've got some extremely um, uh, good book here, Vandana Shiva's The Violence of the Green Revolution, um, The Politics of Genocide Lost in History, written very recently, um, The Sikhs of the Punjab, Religion and Nationalism in, uh, in India, um, The First Anglo-Sikh War, Dyna Dynamics of Sikh Revolution, and then um, some of the best books, um, 
that exist on this top on uh, the subject exist in Punjabi, Vimi Sadidi, Sikh Rajniti, and uh, Kis Bidruli Shahi are just two of those books, um, Chakravya, um, Sikh Nationalism and Identity in a Global Age, um, also a very recent book uh, written by Georgia Shani, um, after 10 years of research um, into understanding Sikh Nationalism. So there's been a huge amount of academic work that's taken place. Um, this is a very, very short list. There, there is a huge number of books. Um, and again, I selected some of these at random, some of these um, uh, purposefully, um, because I, I, can't, I can't tell you which uh, one book here is better than the other. Uh, every book offers an opinion and offers a, a, a commentary. Um, and if you want to really understand, then you're going to have to uh, read as much as is humanly possible. Um, um, and then, then we have traditional engagement with 1984, and a lot of you may see um, and recognize these uh, terms as, as very familiar. There's been a huge number of protests, there's been a huge number of vigils, there's been a huge number of representations to various governments, um, in the United States, Canada, uh, UK, the European uh, Union, European uh, Courts of Justice, um, the Indian government. Um, so there's been a lot of political activity, um, and Nagar Kirtans, um, Nagar Kirtans are uh, uh, always fun and uh, very informative. Um, they reflect what the Sikhs want to talk about, because a Nagar Kirtan is an expression not just of um, of Sikhi in a religious way, but also in a political way. Uh, the leaflets that are distributed, uh, I know, uh, amongst Southall is if uh, where where I am, uh, if it's a representation. Um, of the the wider culture within the diaspora, every year there are youngsters that um, hand out leaflets on various topics, uh, any issue that they feel that um, needs to be discussed. Um, so Nagar Kirtans are always very interesting. Uh, Sikhi camps, uh, um, Sikhi camps uh, are um, in the UK, especially, have been going on for a long time, uh, and are designed to engage Sikh youngsters with their faith. Uh, with um, political aspirations of their ancestors um, and to try to um, bring them to an understanding of the environment and the events that we've talked about. And there's been a huge number of lectures um, on 1984. Many of them are online to look at. Um, there's been um, a huge number of, I mean, Sikri does some fantastic work uh, in this regard. So, so we've engaged very traditionally um, with 1984 uh, very formally. Um, and some of it's different to how um, our ancestors engaged in similar circumstances when, when they were oppressed um, in the times of the Guru or immediately after the times of the Guru uh, when Sikhs were oppressed, how they responded to that oppression. This um, very rarely, uh, in fact, I think hardly ever um, did they conduct protests or, um, or representations to, to governments um, or even vigils. Um, but it, so we, we've changed over the time. We've got another question. Do Sikhs in Punjab feel secure life and property from the state? By Sikh, I mean uh, an average person. The same question applies to Sikhs outside the Punjab. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question as well. Um, it's very hard for me as an individual to say whether Sikhs feel secure in the Punjab, but if if um, social media is an indication, or if um, seek um, expression is an indication, um, then I think that there is a, a very real fear, um, especially because there's been no reconciliation, there's been no acknowledgement of, uh, of events, uh, operations of the government, call them like Woodrow's that took place. Um, there's been very little uh, uh, um, there's been very little justice uh, for the Sikh community in that regard. So, I, I mean, I, if I personally, if I can speak for myself as an individual and um, being a young Sikh, uh, an educated young Sikh, um, if I lived in Punjab and I was going to engage in political activities, I would very certainly be extremely wary and I would be very alert and I would uh, be very cautious um, as to who I engaged with and how I represented myself. Um, being in the diaspora, um, I'm a lot more free to engage in a, any type of political activity. But even 
then there is still this um, there is still this uh, uh, it's more of a doubt than a fear uh, that uh, how will um, the international media and how will the state view um, the Sikh uh, questions and issues especially because India is such a large trading partner uh, with the UK and, and indeed with the US so I, I think it's a uh, uh, there are there is an element of uh, of uh, safety and security there very real um, so aside from the traditional methods of engagement that we've seen taking place in the last uh, uh, 29 years there's been some very interesting ways in which the Sikh community has expressed and engaged with this uh, topic of 1984 these ideas that it represents of sovereignty of justice of independence um, there's been a huge amount of fiction written, this is just some of the examples, um, uh, Days of the Turban, Saffron Salvation, this new novel, um, Helium, which uh, talks about the events of November, um, Under the, the Moonlit Sky, Feast for Lambs, uh, and there's been uh, a few films made as well, this, these are just two of the films, um, there have been quite a few films uh, made um, on these uh, topics, the most recent one being Sadda Haq, uh, probably one of the best ones being Ummu. So, and I know Ummu was written, um, uh, was uh, uh, directed by a, a, a non-Sikh, but it's still um, uh, still a form of expression that relates to the Sikh community. So uh, we've we've written books. Or not only have we uh, written fiction, uh, non-fiction books, we've written fiction uh, in, in a method, in a way to express ourselves. And also, there's been um, uh, a huge amount of art. Um, I mean, the, the one the picture that you see in the center is uh, currently uh, a work in progress. Um, uh, by by uh, an artist called Rupi Kaur from the UK, um, and also the, uh, the the famous one on the left by the Singh Twins, uh, and on the right you see a piece that was uh, commissioned by the uh, NSYF uh, for the Ten Days of Terror campaign. I don't know if, uh, how many of you have seen that, um, and we wanted to try to express um, how Sikhs were treated um, during the the Rasai invasion. Um, and and again, I mean, I, I there were a lot more images that I wanted to cram into this slide, but I thought it's not going to do any of them justice. So there's a huge amount of art, um, a huge number of independent artists as well, youngsters that are trying to connect um, with their identity and and with their their past and uh, and and their political history uh, through art. Um, and I think art is a, a very um, a important form of expression and a form of connecting with an event or with a story um, so this this is very interesting it's been a huge number of events um, internationally um, these three events um, we, we see uh, Maryland uh, um, we see uh, when lions roar that happens in Canada saffron Mike is a recent initiative that's begun in the UK um, and a candle in the dark which is an exhibition um, that took place um, last year uh, the first exhibition of its kind. Hopefully, we see more exhibitions like this taking place. It was a very large-scale um, exhibition, and um, so Sikhs are really trying to um, push uh, the envelope. And um, this is happening, especially amongst the the younger community. Um, uh, music. I mean, here are two uh, 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 production companies, Dharam Seva Records and um, the famous uh, Immortal Productions. I mean, Immortal Productions. There is no way of quantifying um, the impact that this has had on um, young Sikhs uh, and old Sikhs and old Sikhs, in fact. Um, the music that's been produced um, by Immortal Productions, I, I personally know of individuals that it's inspired to reconnect with their faith and become much closer to their guru. Um, there's a huge number of independent artists um, always producing dharmic or um, uh, faith-based music, um, as well as mainstream Punjabi artists who always produce the um, dharmic track, whatever their motivations are. It, it still happens, and you know uh, whether it's good or bad, I, I don't know. Um, but there, we definitely, as a community, try to express ourselves uh, through music. So, on one hand, you have the traditional forms um, of expression. Um, and on the other, you have the, the younger generation that is constantly pushing that envelope, pushing the envelope and trying to um, expand the way in which we um, engage um, uh, as, as a community um, with the events of our past. 
But what's also very interesting is um, the Gulf um, that I talked about that's uh, developing. Um, on one hand, we have a huge amount um, of academic material, um, if I just like to go back, um, as well as these uh, non-fiction books that I've written. Um, so take, for example, Sikh nationalism, nationalism and Identity in a Global Age. Um, that was a part of a PhD thesis. Um, there's there's been a huge amount of academic uh, activity. Um, there continues to be. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work um, of Jakara and, and scholars and and other such initiatives um, by other organisations. Um, there's a massive amount of ac academic work. So it's not as if uh, Sikhs are um, not educated enough to express themselves, but we definitely have this dichotomy between the academics and the grassroots activism because inspired individuals um, take uh, things that have inspired them and take factual information and they try to connect um, the younger generation with the work of the academics through um, camps and lectures and um, vigils and protests and through fiction. Um, so a lot of these ideas uh, that I talked about are based on factual uh, events uh, and through art. Um, uh, for example, the piece on the right, um, the artist that uh, drew that uh, took particular pride in conducting research um, into every aspect um, of this picture. Uh, from the make and model of the weapon um, to the, uh, the markings uh, that soldiers would draw on the weapon to the brand of cigarettes that were smoked uh, to the methods of detainment. Um, so um, there is this um, connection that's been trying to, uh, that's made. I mean, Immortal Technique is a, a very famous political rapper, um, a, a lot of whose work is based um, a, in the reality of the world we live in, um, events um, like Candle in the Dark uh, um, try, is trying to bridge that gap between academia and um, and activism. Um, and the music, um, especially from Immortal Productions, is another a key example of that because they uh, their most recent album uh, Gadda Bigunj is talking about the the Gadda party and Udham Singh and and events that have taken place uh, in our past and trying to reconnect them with a younger audience that then may be inspired to conduct their research. In fact, this webinar is one such um, uh, avenue. And uh, let me just uh, look at these questions that are coming through. Uh, comment from uh, Parat Kumar from South India. I'm from South India. I don't know anything about 1984. Only recently I found uh, out. I wonder why this was kept as a closed chapter. I am saddened and find this needs to be told and shared with the rest of our country. Um, there's a huge amount of suppression uh, during and after um, Operation Blue Star, as the government termed it. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there was a media blackout. Uh, reporters weren't allowed. Human rights uh, activists weren't allowed. Um, and there was a lot of persecution of human rights activists, of reporters. Um, and Brahmacheni was uh, charged with sedition. Uh, I mean, this isn't something that's uh, alien or something that's so far removed. I mean, only recently we've seen a, a cartoonist in India um, uh, being charged with sedition. Also, we've seen two young um, uh, uh, females on Twitter uh, who were commenting about um, uh, the, the gentleman from RSS whose name escapes me um, and who were also arrested. Um, and this is very recently. This happened this year. So uh, this isn't, these aren't very alien uh, concepts, and it shouldn't be shocking that um, a government tries to keep certain events hidden from its population. In fact, it's our duty to bring these out. Um, Navneet Kaur would like to know if there is a website where she can get the list of books um, I mentioned. Uh, yes, it's nsyf.org.uk forward slash books, or just nsyf.org.uk and at the uh, top, there's a, a link for books. Um, and there's a question from, uh, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, Vin, um, Vinam Ar, Vinamarta Ko from Cincinnati, uh, originally from Patiala, Punjab. I am here with uh, my ment ment uh, mentor, Nate Bell. 
and we really enjoyed this webinar. I was wondering when you were uh, when you referred to rate being used as a weapon of war during Operation Woodrose, if you could refer us to any academic sources on the topic, or if you would suggest some resources to look at the genocide and other political events relating to Sikhi using feminist, queer, um, non-normative, slash spiritual lenses. Well, very interesting. Um, there's a lot of work being done by various organizations, and I've mentioned this uh, uh, stuff that's done by um, uh, Sikri, um, 1984 Myths versus Reality, um, it's a video on YouTube, um, and Jakara, the stuff that they do um, with the dialogue that they try to encourage amongst youngsters with core voices, um, the work that NSYF is doing, and, and various other organizations um, um, in South is doing a, a fantastic amount of work. Um, there is a huge amount of resources out there. Um, the book list that I've uh, uh, that's on the NSYF website, um, which we'll be adding more detail to soon, um, provides information and books that talk about um, uh, these activities that took place. Um, uh, because Operation Woodrose was uh, essentially a secret um, operation conducted by the government. Um, that was done outside of the normal hierarchy of control. Um, it's very difficult to ascertain information from government sources. Um, there's a lot of independent work done by Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International, by SAF, that is trying to document um, the violations that took place. Um, I, I don't know if you know about the uh, Suffer, um, the Sikh feminist um, organization. They hopefully should have some information on this. But again, um, uh, social media is a, is a fantastic um, way of connecting with organizations and with connecting with individuals um, uh, to find sources. Um, another question from Sarapur, do you think surrender by Punjabi on the eve of Operation Blue Star could have saved the Sikh community from the aftermath of 1984? Also, yeah, he could have continued his fight. Um, I don't think um, Blue Star or the uh, invasion of the Bar Sahib um, it would have been affected uh, whether Sanjana Singh was there or not. Um, it would have gone ahead regardless. And again, I would refer you to uh, 1984 Myths versus Reality. There's a whole. Um, video devoted to it, I, I would highly recommend uh, you watch it. Um, but I don't think it would have uh, changed the, the course um, of uh, the events uh, at all. In fact, I think the, um, the state was beyond committed. Um, they were beyond um, invested uh, in making sure this operation took place uh, the way that it did. Um, and good stage thing. Could you please provide a reference for the 1973 picture of Bruce Singh and Janessi Pindarani? Also, where and on which uh, date was this photo taken in 1973? Um, that photo was taken, if I'm correct in assuming, um, and I don't know exactly, to be um, entirely honest. Um, I've seen it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I searched for it online and I, I found it. Uh, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't keep the source, but all of this uh, information is, is available uh, online. I mean, we, we, we have a huge amount of resources at our disposal. Um, so going ahead, uh, predictions of the future. Um, so what's next? How, how can we move forward? Um, how can we re-engage or continue our engagement um, with this, this topic. Um, I think a very um, important first step is to understand how Sikhs have responded to similar events in the past. I think it provides a benchmark, it provides a model, it provides a tried and tested methodology of how to deal with similar events and how to react to events. So I think understanding how we responded um, in our past is, is very important. And also, um, I think it's important to directly um, challenge oppression, whether it's political um, or religious and, and domination. Um, I think it's very important where, where, the, where we see it in our lives to continue um, 
uh, this uh, this challenge. It's um, it's what essentially drove the creation of the non Sahib resolution because it wasn't just about the Sikh community; it was about the people of Punjab. Um, I think it's and I think it's very important to develop and share resources. I think Sikri, what they're doing is absolutely fantastic, um, and they're providing a lot of resources out there uh, for people. Um, and I think um, there needs to be a lot more uh, sharing and cooperation amongst Sikh organizations. Um, and I think we also need to hold organizations and individuals accountable. And I think that's something that we need to do um, at, you know, as, as individuals ourselves, but also collectively within our communities. I think that we shouldn't um, uh, uh, tolerate um, any misdirection um, or mismanagement of our community's resources. I, but I think um, that comes from um, truly understanding um, the vision of the gurus and truly connecting with um, our history to then um, so it acts as a check uh, and a balance against your actions. Um, I think it's important to continue to push the boundaries in how we express ourselves. I think that's the most uh, important thing, um, if anything you want to take away from today. Um, it's important that we, whether it's a poetry, whether it's an um, uh, art, whether it's music, um, there's no way of knowing the impact that uh, something like that has on an individual. There's no way of quantifying uh, the impact of a song or of a poem or of a piece of art. Um, books uh, are very useful um, in understanding, um, but in order to connect um, deeper with the topic, I think you need something to inspire you, and I think that's uh, an area where we we were lacking before, um, but now we're very quickly catching up with the rest of the world, and it also helps other people that are not from the Sikh community uh, connect with our history, because uh, if I was a non-Sikh, I personally wouldn't read a book about Sikh political history. It's probably something that wouldn't interest me. A lot of Sikhs don't read books about Sikh political history. But everybody can connect to art, everybody can connect to uh, fiction, everybody can connect to film, uh, to poetry. I think this is an area um, uh, within our community, especially within the younger generation, that we need to develop more talent and we need to invest more resources um, uh, 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 in art and, and expression and, and really changing the way uh, we engage with um, this conversation. Next year we're going to see um, the 30 year um, anniversary of the invasion of the Bar side um, and hopefully um, we will see some change in the way um, we deal with this and, and also I'd like to um, challenge this notion of, of justice, of, um, of justice is something that can be delivered to us especially by a, a government. I, I think uh, any government, and this is not a criticism of the Indian government or uh, in particular, but I think any government um, is incapable of um, providing justice. Uh, I think uh, justice is something that is unquantifiable uh, in a generic sense. It's something very personal. Um, and I think um, this, um, this idea of justice, we need to really reassess uh, what it is. Um, Oh, um, so, sorry. Um, so I just uh, no, it's popped up. The the photo um, of Kapoor Singh is available in Gurdaj Singh's Chakravya, um, and it has the date mentioned. So hopefully that answers um, the previous um, the person's question, Gurdaj Singh's question. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I think uh, um, um, that, that's the end of the presentation. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, for listening and I hope you enjoyed um, the presentation. If there's any feedback or uh, information you can um, you can send it to um, via our website or um, on, on Twitter um, at the NSYF um, on Twitter so um, please do share your feedback and then hand it over uh, back to Baiso, um, uh for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shimshir Singh, for a very informative and uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I know I definitely got a lot out of it as well. And um, thank you, 
everyone for your questions and um, apologies uh, to anyone whose questions were not answered due to time uh, constraints. But uh, please be reminded that the webinars are provided for uh, for free, but uh, there's a cost associated with technology and administration. So if you feel you benefited from this, uh, please consider becoming a webinar sponsor. More details can be obtained from info at secre.org. And uh, a reminder that uh, everyone on the email, uh, on the everyone who registered for the webinar will get a link uh, to the recording within seven days. And if uh, you don't uh, get that, please contact info at sikri.org. Uh, and uh, the presentation, 1984 Myths and Realities, I know a couple of you had asked questions about that, so uh, we'll make sure that we'll send that along with the link uh, or in a separate email, a link to that presentation as well that was put together. Now, uh, Shamshir Singh, I'd like to hand it over for any closing comments. And once again, thank you, Vaik Khalsa Ujjee Fateh. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me um, this opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, about the topic. Um, just uh, well, thank you very much to everybody who's um, listened and um, if I've made any mistakes, uh, please do um, uh, correct me. Um, you can do so uh, on uh, Twitter um, or we have a Facebook page as well. Um, we have an email info at nsy.org.uk um, so if you have any feedback or any comments or you can share it with uh, Sikri, I'm sure they'll, they'll pass it on to us. So um, thank you, thank you very much for listening and I, I hope it's given you some food for thought. Thank you.